So we'll talk about addition today, and probably Friday too. Addition, uh, and specifically, addition of positive two numbers. And I've said this is in a pedagogy class, which is true. I'm not going to, you know, tell you here's how much time you'll need to spend on it, or and I can't tell you what the common mistakes your students might make are. But parts of this class are, I would say, pedagogy adjacent, like making sure you remember how this was presented to you when you were a kid so that you can present it to the children in your hair. Probably the way that addition was first presented to all of us was taking blocks and putting them together. I, Sadly, the, the room with the um, locks in it was locked and I couldn't get a key. So, but you have, you know, one block, two blocks, three blocks. And then you have one, two, three, four, five blocks, and you take these two collections of blocks and you throw them together. Now you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight blocks. You take three blocks, and five blocks, and put them together, you get eight blocks. Three plus five equals eight. So this conception of addition works well when you've got, you know, markers or apples or all the kind of stuff that, you know, traditionally gets used in these early grade lectures. It's a little awkward if you're thinking about putting distances together, for example. You know, if you have three feet of ribbon and then you have five feet of a different other ribbon. How many feet of ribbon do you have? Well, it's a little awkward to think of each of those blocks as a foot of ribbon because, well, because the ribbon isn't in pieces. So another way that addition often gets presented is using a number line. And because we are only working with positive numbers at this point in our career, the number line, a number line starts at zero, and then We count up, what a count all the way up to eight. And this provides us with an alternative way of discussing addition. Let's say we have three feet of green ribbon. Cannot spell. Let's try two of these. And we have five feet 
And we want to know rho and O, how many feet. We can visualize this by thinking of a number line as a ruler, or in this case, a whatever a ruler would be if it had feet on it instead of inches. We have one, two, three feet of blue of green ribbon. And we have one, two, three, four, five feet of blue ribbon. So how many feet of ribbon do we have in all? Well, we have eight feet of ribbon. And its number line model, and really this model as well, are also going to be helpful when we want to start talking about properties of addition. For example, when we talk about commutivity, the idea that when you're adding stuff up, order doesn't matter, we can demonstrate that visually using either this model or this model. We'll get to that in due time, however. Let me keep with the order that the textbook presents stuff in. This is called methods of addition, but really it's a collection of tricks. And these tricks are probably the closest we come in this class to really teaching pedagogy. When we think, well, before we could just do seven plus six, how would we do it? Well, we could say, well, seven and three is 10, and then another three is 13. And that trick has a name in the textbook, making 10. Not seven plus three, let's do seven plus eight. That's a hard one. Or at least it's a hard one for kids. And let's think how we might sort of approach this without just, you know, giving the answer. Well, when we first learn to do addition, it's probably on our fingers. We start with seven and then we count up eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So the so-called counting up method. Making 10 is based on the idea that if we're adding 10 to something, we're going to be able to just do that even as kids without spending time counting up. 10 plus four is 14, 10 plus seven is 17, 10 plus a number, you just take the zero in the 10 and you replace it with that number. So let's count up seven, eight, nine, 10. And now 10 plus anything is easy to do. So if we realize that we've used three of the eight getting up to 10, seven plus eight is 10 plus five is 15. This making 10 method 
is going to work especially well in early days when you're still messing around with blocks and counting blocks to teach students addition. Because if you're messing around with blocks, then this five is just going to sort of scream out at you. Let's say we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven blocks. And then we've got One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight blocks. And we start putting them together. So we'll take one block here and we'll move it over. And now we've got eight blocks over on the left. We'll take another block and move it over. And now we've got nine blocks on the left. We'll take another block and move it over. And now we've got 10 blocks on the left. And we've got five blocks on the right. And 10 blocks and five boxes, 15 blocks. So this, I think, answers kind of an objection to this method. I mean, when you first see this method, sort of the, the objection that stands out, or at least the objection that stands out to me, is that this method for elementary addition then requires your students to do subtraction. That is to say, we go from seven to 10 by adding three, we go from eight to five by subtracting three. Well, surely if your students are struggling with addition, they're going to struggle with that subtraction as well. But once you start representing it visually, you're just moving blocks. You're not requiring your students to do subtraction. So that's a trick. I, Maybe I shouldn't say, but it's a trick I use to this day, not necessarily with numbers like seven and eight, but if I want to add like 97 and 12, I'll go, okay, 97, 98, 99, 100, 109. So that's what the book calls making 10. The other method that the book presents that you can sort of think of as a trick or a shortcut is doubles. And doubles is similar to making 10, but doubles is based around the idea that you I mean, I don't know what you do nowadays. When I was a child, we have a 10 by 10 grid, the addition tables, and you just sort of drew it. Doubles is based on the idea that students learn to add like 1 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 3 plus 3, 4 plus 4, and so on. That a student who will think 8 plus seven is tricky, we'll be able to do eight plus eight or seven plus seven. And presenting it visually, let's use doubles to add four plus seven. Okay, we have four blocks.
we have seven blocks. Four plus seven, using the doubled trick, is the idea that we start with the bigger number of blocks. We start with seven. Let's just take four of that seven and push them away. So now we have four and four and three. Four and four is hopefully done quickly in the student's head. Four plus four is eight. And then eight plus three. Eight plus three is not necessarily easy, but the student can count on eight, nine, 10, 11. And the point of this is that if the student didn't rearrange the box this way, and you just started counting on, you go four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, you get to the same number ultimately, but you're doing a lot more counting. So this is intended to reduce the counting on your fingers that the student is doing, of course, with the ultimate goal of getting them to where they are not counting on their fingers at all. Let's talk. Well, so we looked at these sort of small additions. We should look at larger additions, like 107 plus 238. Before we do that, there's a sort of digression, but it's an important digression on the properties of addition. Does anybody have any questions so far? From properties of addition. So these are elementary properties that everyone knows. Um, maybe not everybody knows the fancy multi-syllable names we give them. Addition is commutative. So this sounds very formidable, but all of this is saying is that when you're doing addition, order doesn't matter. A plus B equals B plus A. And this is easily demonstrated, again, by thinking of addition in terms of blocks. I mean, the statement that four plus five and five plus four are the same. Well, let's say we have four blocks. And then we have five blocks. We can understand addition as just taking these blocks and mushing them together in a big pile. And when we take these blocks, and put them together in a big pile, we're always going to have these 
four box and then five more box. So of course the pile we get at the end is identical. The fact that on the left-hand side, we had four blocks on the left and five blocks on the right versus having five blocks on the left and four blocks on the right is completely inconsequential. Now the second property is called associativity. Um, or you can say addition is associative. And associativity is a property where when you first look at it, it seems kind of arcane and as if it doesn't really matter much. But um, this statement that we can move, basically, that we can move parentheses around when we're adding is profoundly important. And the reason it's profoundly important is that we think of just add addition as things, as something you do to two numbers. You have two numbers, you add them together. So what if, however, what if you don't want to only add two numbers? What if you want to add three numbers together? Well, that's fine to add three numbers together. First, we add the two numbers, then we add that third number. But why do we have to do it in that order? You might ask, what happens if instead of first adding the first two numbers, I want to start by adding the second two numbers and then throw in that A? So associativity says it's perfectly fine. Just pick two numbers, you add them together, then you add the third number in. It doesn't matter which numbers you And this can, just as a matter of convenience, you know, associativity says, and commutivity together, say that if you're adding three numbers, you can do the addition in whatever order you want. And sometimes one order is going to be more convenient than another order. Like here, 12 plus 8. That's convenient. 12 plus 8 is a nice number. It's 20. And then 20 plus 7 is easy. It's 27. But what if instead of 12 plus 8 plus 7, you have like 12 plus 9 plus 8? Well, between them, commutivity and associativity say you can do the addition in whatever order you want. The fact that this 12 and this 8 now have this 9 in between them is no barrier to adding them together first and getting a nice number and being able to do the addition very conveniently. If you didn't do that, if you didn't do a little rearranging, that addition on the left would be a pain. I have to think, okay, 12 plus 12 plus 8 is 20, plus 1 is 21, plus 8 
is 29. And I mean, you get there in the end, but sometimes you want, I mean, sometimes doing the addition in the right order simplifies things like it did with these problems. An addition and commutivity say, well, you can do that. You can simplify the problems in that way. The vast property that's going to get a fancy sounding name in spite of actually being a very straightforward statement is the so-called identity property. And the identity property says that adding zero doesn't change a number. Which again, I mean, one of these things that probably makes sense to all of you, but if you're trying to explain it to someone for the first time, and you want to look at three plus zero. And when you have three blocks, and then over here you don't have any blocks, you put your you put your hands around these and you smush all the blocks you have together. You know? Now your blocks are in the middle of the table, but you still only have three of them. So I don't know, I always call this the standard addition algorithm. I don't know if it has an actual name. And to be honest, I only call it standard because it's what I learned when I was a kid. So maybe some self-centeredness there. But this is the algorithm where you line up digits You add the digits one by one. And if you get anything bigger than the 10, you have to carry a one. So something like 1,027 plus 2,100. 46. It's an algorithm for when you have larger numbers. So we start by lining the digits up. What I mean by that is we've got our ones places and our tens places and our hundreds and our thousands places, and we line them up. So our thousands places line up, our hundreds places line up, our tens place, and our ones place. We put a line here, and we do this addition from right to left. There are a few other algorithms um, we'll see. And some of those other algorithms sort of are based around the idea that we really do everything else from the left to the right. I mean, we read left to right, so we should add the same way. But this algorithm is right to left meaning you start with the seven and the six and you add them up 
and you get 13. But you can't write a 13 there. And the reason you can't write the 13 there is that this is the ones place. And a number in the ones place can be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It can't be bigger than nine. So what we do is we say, well, 13 is a 10 and a three. So we can't have a 13 in the ones place. So we'll take the three. The three can go into the ones place. And then this 10 has to go into the tens place. So what we call carrying a one. And now we've got a four and a two, so that's a six in the tens place, but we have this extra one in the tens place for a seven. In the hundreds place, we have a zero and a one. One hundred. And in the thousands place, a two and a three. 3,000. So this is addition as it was taught to me like 30 some years ago. And I suspect it's how most people still learn to act. There are a few alternative algorithms that have made bids for prominence. I don't think any of them have successfully replaced this, but we'll still talk briefly about some of the alternatives. So we'll start with the so-called expanded algorithm. And we'll demonstrate this via example. Say you have a 37 and a 28, and you want to add these together. Well, the X, um, we'll start by adding eight and seven and we'll get 15. And this, let me really quick. Do this using the standard algorithm. Seven plus eight is 15, carry the one, then three and two and one is six. So the expanded algorithm also starts by adding that eight and that seven. And the expanded algorithm says, okay, you get 15 when you do that. Here, when you, you get 15, but you then write that 15 in a super awkward way. I mean, that 15 is that one and that five. So 15 gets broken up. So it's tens digit is way over there and it's ones digit is way over there. Or if we get 15, let's just write down 15. So we added the ones, um, we got 15. Now let's add the tens, 30 and 20. 
when we add the tens, we get 50. And now we have to do another addition, but this addition is simpler. There's never going to be any carrying. We're going to have a five, and then a five plus one is six. So we get 65. If we just take the ones, we add them. We take the tens, we add them. And then we combine those things together. So that's the expanded algorithm. It has its benefits and it has its flaws. I, as I say, I don't think it's successfully replaced what I think of as the standard algorithm. I mean, the benefit is that these numbers are written clearly. Seven and eight give you 15, and you write down 15, nice and simple. I mean, the flaws are that you're doing weird things with the ones columns and the tens columns. I mean, or I guess not even that so much. I guess the main weakness is that you then have to do a second edition after the first edition. So the price you pay to get these ones and these ten separate is that you then have to do this second edition. And the second edition is quick. But I don't know if most people think it's worth the hassle. And sort of the so-called partial sums algorithm. Well, there are actually two partial sums algorithms, a left one and a right one. And the partial sum algorithms are based, are very similar to the alternate algorithm. In fact, the right partial sums algorithm basically is the alternate algorithm. The textbook treats these as if they're different things, but they're very closely related. And these are both similar to the alternate algorithm in the sense that they're based around the idea that if you add 500 and 700 and you get 1,200, you ought to just write that 1,200 down. If you add 60 and 50 and you get the 110, you ought to just write that 110 down. If you add eight and seven and you get 15, you ought to just write that 15 down. You shouldn't bother carrying and breaking your numbers up in weird ways. And the reason I call this the left partial sums algorithm is we're going to start on the left. And we say, okay, we have our ones place and our tens place and our hundreds place. So that five is really 500, and that seven is really 700. And we add them up, and we get 1,200. And now we'll deal with the 60 and the 50. I say the 60 and the 50, we have a six and a five, but the six is in the tens place and the five is in the tens place. So they're really 60 and 50. 60 and 50 is um, 110.
So we add the tens place, we get a hundred and ten. Then we add the eight and the seven, and we get fifteen. And now we do a second addition, but the second addition should be simple. Five, two, three, one. And that's the partial sums algorithm, or the left partial sums algorithm. And again, the fact that it hasn't managed to totally replace the standard algorithm. I mean, we should admit there is inertia. There is parents saying, well, I learned it this way. But I mean, I would say legitimately, this has its pros and its cons. Um, for the pros, well, again, you're not doing weird carrying. You're not taking your numbers and breaking them up in weird ways. You're just adding the numbers and then jotting down what you get. You're working from left to right, which is neat. Most mathematics is done from left to right. I mean, if you see five plus seven minus two, what you'll probably do is five plus seven is 12, minus two is 10. We read from left to right, we do math from left to right, until we get to this addition algorithm, where suddenly we're going the other way. Suddenly we're on the right and moving left. So this gets rid of that. Uh, it does on the downside. Well, first of all, you do the addition and then you have to do more addition. I guess another downside is that it does weird things to our ones, tens, hundreds, and thousands place. Like this is our hundreds place. This is our hundreds place. This is our thousands place all of a sudden. I mean, it also requires, and you can think of this as a pro or a con, but it requires the kid to have a very clear idea of what's happening when they're doing addition with the tens place and the hundreds place and the thousands place. Like you can teach carrying without the student having any idea why this works. You just drill down in the student. If you get a number that's bigger than 10, you have to carry that one over there. The student doesn't have to understand. So I do this addition and I get a 15 and I break the 15 into a 5 and a 10. And then because I have a new 10, I put a 1 in the 10 space. Here, the student really has to understand. Okay, this five is in the hundreds place. This seven is in the hundreds place. So I'm not really adding five and seven. I'm adding 500 and 700. So I'm getting 1,200. So pros and cons. And if you'll give me one minute extra, I call this the right partial sums. Left partial sums is doing the same thing, except we've got this eight and this seven first. And then we add this six and this five, only the six and the five are really 60 and 50, 
And then we add the five and the seven. Only the five and the seven are really five hundred and seven hundred. I would just, I mean, I would just sort of call this. I guess this does have one advantage, and the advantage it has is that our faces line up. One's place, one's place, one's place. Tens place, tens place, tens place. Hundreds place, hundreds place, hundreds place. And that brings us right to the end of class. Don't even need the extra minute. I will see you on Friday. Yeah.